morning. Is, is the mic on? Is it on now? Can you, okay. All right. Get closer. All right. Well, welcome. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church this morning. We are glad everyone is here. Uh, announcements. We don't have a lot this morning, but I'll just call your attention to the vote uh, last week on renovating the sanctuary. It was a unanimous vote. So we'll get get figured out how to finance that and get move, moving forward. And then I want to call attention to the meetings this afternoon, both the diaconate and the session at both 2.30 and 3.30. So, and now I would ask you to stand for our call to worship. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. Now let us come together in worship before his holy throne. Amen and Amen. Now remain standing for our hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let us recite what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born under Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seateth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Now we'll have our scripture reading from the Old Testament, Genesis 45, 1 through 15. Now hear the word of God. 
Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, and lord to all of his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me. You and your children, and your children's children, as well as your flock, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry, bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we continue in our worship, let us bring before the Lord our confessions that we might know of his grace and his mercy. First, let us pray silently our own private prayers of confession, and then let us join together praying today's unified prayer of confession. Let us pray. Now let us pray together. Almighty God, we beseech you, hear our prayers. We live in a broken world among broken people, and yes, we ourselves are broken as well. Help us to see our neighbors as you see them. Allow us to love others as you love them, restoring us to righteous relationships with you and your creation. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And friends, it is true, we are a broken people in a broken world. There are many tragedies, many things that vex us, many things that we do not understand why they happen, except for the fact that sin has sought to separate us from God's love. But our God is greater than that. He would not leave us in a state of sin. He would not leave us separated, but has called out through us through the words of the prophets, and most especially through the word of his son, Jesus Christ, who came into the world that we might know and see God's true love. We might see his true salvation. And though in true tragedy we see that he bore our sins and thus died in our place. But again on the third day was raised that we might know the truth of God's glory. So hear and believe the good news this day. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, we are forgiven. Amen and amen. And now if our youngest members will come forward for our time with the youth. Alright. Hey, y'all have a seat down there. Alright. So y'all paying attention to Dr. Jim? 
when he read the scripture. Who was it about? Joseph? Mm -hmm. What's something that Joseph gave his brothers? <laughs> no, he didn't give them lemons. No. <laughs> forgiveness, right? He gave them some material things, but he also gave them forgiveness. So, y'all ever had somebody do something mean to you or say something mean? You want a lemon white? I've seen you eat lemons as an appetizer before. You want one? Y'all want to just try a lemon, please? Here, I'll hold your hand open. Oh, here, you want another one? You're going to get off the floor? Just leave it laying there. I'll get it just there. There you go. You want to try a lemon? Have you tried a lemon before? <clears throat> What's it taste like, White? Sour. Sour, right. So when somebody does something bad to you and you just hold on to that and you think about it all the time and you just stay mad at that person that did something mean to you, it makes you sour and bitter, right? All right, you're gonna keep eating it and throw it in there. Yeah, all right. So what Joseph did with his brothers is he forgave them. So we got more lemons here, these are different. You want to try one, Anza? You want to try one of these? Yeah. Uh-uh, no. Hold your hand open. I'm not going to feed you with tongs. <laughs> All right, well, right, try this, man. You want to try this one, Anza? No? Okay. Try that one, White, and describe it to me. It is, what's it taste like? Tastes like lemonade, okay? So it's lemon, but it's got sugar on it, right? So it's a little sweeter, isn't it? You gonna keep it? Uh, you gonna keep it? <laughs> so the lemon with sugar is supposed to represent when you forgive somebody. So a lemon without sugar is sour and sweet and bitter, and that's when you hold on to that grudge and don't have forgiveness. But the lemon with sugar is sweeter, right? So it's still, it's still a lemon, something bad still happened, but you forgive them and it's a little bit sweeter and you feel better inside, okay? All right, throw them lemons in here. You go watch. All right, Anthony, you want to say a prayer for us? Stand up here. Heavenly Father, help me love, help me care, help me smile, help me share, help me give, Help me grow, help me laugh, help me know. Amen. All right, come here, White Man. All right, good job, Dad. Let's go through. All right, go have a good day. All right, now is our time for prayers for the people. We have Patsy Norwood, the Rachel Duck family, the Poole family, Bonnie McDaniel, Wayne and Ginger Whitwell, the family of Miss Lee Voice, and the Methodist Church as well. Uh, she's been with them a long time, and they're honoring her this morning. John Criswell, Richard Criswell, Kim Johns, David Spencer, Harold Swindle, the Wesley Bell family, Tracy Lowe, Terry Tucker Baxter, Heron Yarbrough, Jimmy Harper, Hopper, no, Harper, Charlie Lancaster, Kathy Arrington, R.L. Mackin, Mandy Elliott, Jean Cole, 
Debbie Hutchinson, Mark Crocker, the Mathis and the Rollins families, Alice Shivers, Daryl Walker, and Bentley Holdem and all the school districts and all the students at the schools. Are there any other? Lee Edmonston. Lee Edmonston. Betty Langston family. Betty Langston family. Greg Bryant. Greg Bryant. Neil Ernest. And the Gray family. Neil Ernest and the Gray family. Larry Dell. Earl Privet, Earl Privet family, and then I miss one. Larry Dell. Best dad, Larry. Larry Dell. Larry Dell. Okay, is that every everyone? All right. Holy Father, you alone sustain us. You give us life. You give us hope. You give us love. Be with these individuals and with these families as they go through these times of illness and crisis, Lord. Touch them, heal them as only you can. And now, Heavenly Father, let us pray as your Son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen and now we will have our offertory. And uh, if you have your offering, please bring it forward uh, to the plate. pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for each and every blessing that you give us. We ask that you please bless these tithes and offerings that we bring back to you. Help us to use it in a way that is pleasing to you and furthers your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Our gospel lesson today comes from the Gospel of Matthew. It is from the 15th chapter. We'll be reading verses 21 through 28. Again, that is Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 through 28. Let us hear now the gospel according to Matthew. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from the region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps after us, shouting after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. But she came and she knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is God's word for his people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please have a seat. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> I enjoy a lot of the stories from the Old Testament. I, I like hearing about the kings and some of the battles, some of the more obscure ones, but I really like what we've been doing lately, and that is talking about the patriarchs and talking about Joseph. These are some stories that I can remember as a kid growing up, and we used to make little, little popsicle stick figures that we would get to dance around. Now, I'm not sure how theologically relevant Revelant, a popsicle stick figure is, but it's a fond memory I have. And I remember one of, one of the, the favorite ones here is, now, we talk about Joseph, and what is, what is the one picture, the one thing, item that comes to your mind when we talk about Joseph? The coat of many colors, which, when I went to seminary, they ruined it for me. You know, there was never, the, the translation was not many colors, but it actually just refers to a very fine garment that goes all the way to the wrist and to the ankles. Basically, it was a long coat. And I thought, well, that kind of ruins some of the stories I grew up on. But in fact, it doesn't really ruin it too much. I mean, because the, fa the fact that it was many colors or a single color, the s simple fact is, is Joseph had a fancy coat. And that wouldn't have been a problem if, like my son, Joseph was an only child because no one would have been upset. But Joseph wasn't an only child. At this point, he was the youngest of 11 brothers. And because of his father's favor, because his father treated him special and different, the other brothers didn't like him very much. And so, as we read last week, they came up with a plan to take care of him. So, they jumped him, they threw him in a pit, they sold him into slavery, and he spent a long time in Egypt. And a matter of fact, his days in Egypt really weren't much better than this time in the pit. You see, when he first went, he was sold into slavery, and he was working in the house, and he actually had a situation where he did what was right, but got thrown in jail, because he didn't have any power himself. He was a scapegoat, if you were. And then in jail, he meets up with the cupbearer, another high official, and helps him out, but as soon as the cupbearer gets out of prison, he forgets Joseph. And so Joseph has kind of a miserable time there in the middle of his life. But eventually things turned around for Joseph. Eventually he got noticed. Eventually his God-given gifts brought him out of prison, brought him out of poverty, of obscurity, of slavery, all the way up to who was the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. Only the Pharaoh was greater than he. And so in today's story, that's where Joseph is. That's where he meets his brothers. And there's this, it's this wonderful, wonderful story of reunion and reconnection. Now, there's some fun intrigue. I, I recommend y'all go back and read some of the details on this. Because he messes with his brother's head just a little bit, like any good younger brother would. I mean, not, not hardcore, but he does kind of play a trick on him a little bit and makes him sweat it out. But we're at the point of the story where he's past all that. 
And he announces, it is I, is my father okay? You're going to be okay? He tells him that basically, not only are you going to be okay, but what you've done was actually God taking care of all of us. What you intended for evil, God has now made for good. And so he proclaims what good is going on in this situation. And it's a great story. But you know, it's kind of interesting to me because it causes me to go back and think how all of this happened. Now let's go back to what I was talking about. Why did Joseph go to Egypt in the first place? I mean, okay, the, the overall answer is because God ordained that it would happen. But in the story, what led up to that? His brothers didn't like him. And why didn't his brothers like him? He was spoiled. He was a brat. His dad, now here's the thing, I don't completely blame Joseph himself. I mean, his dad always gave him the best. His dad always held him back from doing some of the work. His dad put him in this special place. And let's face it, who wouldn't like dad showing him a little special attention? And so he grew up in this, and he kind of thought highly of himself, and he rubbed his brother's noses in it. Now, I'm not saying that he was, you know, completely a bad character. It's just that maybe he didn't know any better. Because that's what happens in cases where we show favoritism to some over others. They start to think more of themselves than they ought to, and they start to put themselves over others. And let's face it, in human relationships, we don't like that. We don't like people who are self-appointed, big shots, who think they're better than us. Right? We have a saying... Now, I've lived in so many different regions of the country. I, I believe this is a southern saying, but is, is there not something about don't get above your raising? Okay, by the, by the laughter, apparently I did get the right region this time. Because every now and then I throw something out, people go, no. And I go, oh, maybe that was a Midwestism. But that's the problem was he didn't really get above his raising because he was raised to be like that. So it was kind of Jacob's fault. Now... I couldn't help but see some parallels. And some of these parallels, at first, are almost like a paradox. It's almost confusing when we say, okay, well, Jacob put his brothers underneath Joseph, if not directly, indirectly by the way he treated them. And thus caused the animosity between the brothers and Joseph, which led to them making a really bad choice. Because let's face it, no matter how big a brat your brother is, selling him into slavery is never a good thing. Alright? Can we all agree on that? But even in this, he says that God had done this and worked it out for the good. Now, as I said, there's a parallel here. Is it wrong to have favorites? I know, I've, I've been doing this the last couple of weeks and now people are like, I'm not answering that. Okay, in our world, in our understanding, in our families, do we think it's wrong to have favorites? And the answer to that is, of course it is. You know, if, if you were to pit your children against one another, I mean, none of us would think that's good. Now, of course, I've never seen a family where kids didn't blame. Like, I'll, t I'll be honest with you, I'll tell you, my brother and sister growing up swore that I was my mom's favorite. Especially in adulthood. She goes, oh yeah, you, you went to seminary. You became a minister. You're Mr. Goody Two-Shoes. And I'm like, well, I can tell you. I can remember being grounded. I can remember, um, well, I can remember my backside being warmed a few times. So, you know, the, if I was a favorite, it wasn't, by, it wasn't by far. But in truth, I don't believe that there was favoritism there. I just believe there, in most cases, we treat people differently. And you have to. You can't treat all your children the same, can you? Of course not, because there's different circumstances. First of all, you have the first child, and you only have one, so you kind of really focus on them, you know. And now you're, you're still chasing after that one, but now you got to, if, if you have them close together, now you have another one. And so, you know, you got to kind of balance between the two, but you don't put them both in diapers. No, one's already got out of it. So you have to treat your kids different at different stages in their lives. And that being the case, sometimes they think that, well... One was favored over another. And that's a human nature. That, and that's kind of like in the story. I'm, I do believe Joseph was favored over. But I also believe his brothers probably amplified this. Because, let's face it, when someone seems to be getting something good, it's natural for us to say, 
I wish that happened to me. I mean, you imagine you're walking around with, with some friends and you, your friend bends over and picks up a hundred dollar bill that you happen to be blowing across the thing. Now how many of us would, would just say, oh, man, I wish I had found that. That's an easy one. I wish I would have found that if somebody else found it. I'm not going to try to take it from them. But let's face it, you know, that's not a bad thing to happen. But what happens is instead of, I wish that had happened to me, people start telling themselves, that should have been mine. And that's where the trouble comes in. Because if that should have been mine, then the problem is that person got something they didn't deserve. They have something that I begin to start thinking is mine and is owed to me. And of course that's where jealousy, that's where envy, that's where strife, that's where a lot of the negative things that affect our society come in is when we start pointing at others who have it different than us. And let's face it, that's just the nature of society. Everybody can't be the same. Everybody doesn't have the same education level. Everybody doesn't have the same intelligence. Everybody doesn't have the same work ethic. Everybody doesn't have the same skill set. So the simple fact is, is that when we look around, there will always be people that seem to have more and people that seem to have less. And I can tell you, if you happen to be someone who has more and you start thinking, this is what I'm owed, that's a bad mindset to get into because you think, I should have this. And so instead of just realizing that you're blessed, you start to internalize and think you're better than other people. And sometimes when you're on the other end and you look at somebody who has more than you and say, I should have that, then envy, then greed, then other things come in and that leads to turmoil and friction. And that is what this story depicted. A group of people in turmoil because some thinking they're better than they ought, some getting above their raising, and some thinking they deserve more than what they got. Now, in a family among humans, this is easy to see how it happens because we're finite, we're limited. We don't fully understand everything that's going on. The problem is, like I said, this is in parallel because let me ask you, does God play favorites? I'll give you a hint. The answer to that is yes. God picked Abraham and took him and said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And then, how many sons did Abraham have? Two. Now, we all think of Isaac, but there was also Ishmael. And God chose Isaac over Ishmael. Ishmael was sent away. Isaac was the heir. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And even though there was some intrigue and there were some other problems, God said, I choose Jacob over Esau. And so he established his people. And let me tell you something. God chose the Israelites. The Jews are God's chosen people. If that confuses you, if you don't think that's fair, if you don't think that's right, if, if, if you have never heard anybody be that direct about it, let me be utterly clear. If you read the Bible and believe that the Bible is the Word of God, then you can come to no other conclusion than God has a chosen people and those chosen people are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. Those are whom God set up, and he said that my salvation will come through that, and he worked it out so that Jesus Christ was Jewish. He was a son of David. He was dedicated at the temple. He was raised under Jewish traditions and customs. God worked out his salvation in the way he chose. Now here's the problem I have. If I were to be talking to parents and they told me they had a favorite, I would probably tell them that's not a good plan. That's, that's going to lead to strife and contention. That's because we're limited. God, on the other hand, God has every right to pick favorites. He created the entire world, the universe, everything. Everything that exists is because God caused it to exist and if God caused everything to exist then does not God have the right to choose one thing over another yes maybe this is not a trick question the answer to this one is yes God has every right God is in control God is all-powerful. God is almighty. God is perfect. And therefore, even though we may not be able to understand it, remember a couple weeks ago I talked about 
we can't put God in a box. We try to. We try to define God. We try to say, shouldn't God do this? Wouldn't it be better if God did that? And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get your mind around God. But every time we do that, we start to limit God. And we start to try to box God in. The only problem is, you can't limit that which is limitless. You can't box in that which is everywhere, that which is beyond all manner of time and space and our understanding. All you can do at that point is turn your box the appropriate direction and receive what God has for you to receive. To understand what God is willing to let you understand and just to, to accept and submit to the rest. And that's hard because, well, I mean, we're relatively intelligent people. You know, we're not running around in the mud with sticks and trying to stab woolly mammoths anymore. We have smartphones and computers in our cars and computers on our desk and access to a ton of information. We understand so much about the world and yet what we understand about God is still only that we can accept what he has given us. So why did God choose Israel? Why did God define this is chosen people as the Israelites? And the answer is, because he did. What does that mean for us? Well, I'm looking around and while we haven't taken, none of us have taken, well I don't know, has anybody here taken the genealogy test? Anybody? No? Okay, so that's just everybody else in the world is taking those. I figure at least one or two of you would have said, sure. But, you know, I don't know about you, I, I, I've never taken one, but I do know my basic background. And there's no Jewish in my body. There's no Israelite in my, as far back as we can tell. Now, you go far enough back that we can all connect to uh, Noah, if you read the story. But, again, I'm not one of these chosen. So, I wonder then, what does that mean for me? But, you see, when God set aside Israel, when he said, these are my chosen people, he did not just simply choose them and say, okay, you're number one and everybody else is nothing. He basically said, I'm choosing you to work up my salvation for the world through you. In other words, the light of God shines through his chosen people and that was the intention. Just like any time that we acknowledge that we have received a blessing from God, that blessing is not for us to take and use ourselves and internalize and hold on to. We are blessed that we might be a blessing to others. We are given favor by God so that we may show favor to others. God loves us that we may know how to and be able to love others. Do you remember Jesus' command? This new command I give you. Love others as I have loved you. Not, I love you so, you know, rub that in other people's faces, but love others because I have loved you. And see, I believe that is the story of Israel. And he chose them to make examples and to use them. And if you look throughout the Old Testament, through the life and times of the Israelite people, they had times of great faithfulness and times where they rebelled. There were times when they, matter of fact, right now they're in a high moment because they're in Egypt. But you know what happens in a couple hundred years. Pretty soon there's a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And they enslaved the Israelites for 400 years. And then there's the whole exodus and there's lots of great stuff. And of course, they have, again, great moments of faith. And then they make that golden calf. Things get bad again. They have kings and prophets. Sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. But you know, I think it's important for us to see because God set aside these people to show I have a relationship with them. I choose these people to be my people and I am their God. And even though those people failed immensely, God never does. And so, even though the Israelites have had trouble, a matter of fact, Paul talks about it in Romans. He is upset because why have God's chosen people rejected the Messiah? How can this be? How can this work out? But he comes to the conclusion that even though the people were unfaithful, even though the people failed, God never fails. God always works things out for his glory and to his purpose. And so, I don't know how exactly, I don't know 
all the details because they weren't given. But what I can tell you for sure is God's people are still God's people. The Israelites are still God's chosen. They are his beloved. They are his children. And God has worked out his relationship with them. And through them, we too get to enjoy that. We as Gentiles. Now, that's kind of a funny word. We don't really use the word Gentile anymore. It's kind of archaic, abstract, but you know, in the Bible, that's what we are. You're one of two things. You're either a Jew or a Gentile. So, all of that seems like a lot of, well, that's nice, but what does that mean for us? Well, this idea must be understood somewhat in order to understand the passage that it seemed like I was just going to skip over and not talk about. You know, the Joseph story is a fun story to talk about. Even though there's some intrigue, even though there's some backbite, even though there, there's some rough stuff. I mean, there's lots of good stuff in there. There's lots of, I mean, here we are at a point of salvation for the people. But now I have to come back to what I read out of Matthew. And, you know, I have to admit, I actually like this story. When I saw that it came up in the election, I was like, well, this is going to be fun. Because it's a hard story to hear. It's one that is easily misinterpreted or dismissed or played down because it doesn't meet our sensibilities, especially in this politically correct world where we have to always say nice things about everybody and no one can ever just, you know, say things as they are. But here we are, beginning of the story, Jesus is heading towards a Gentile region, Sidon and Tyre. Two cities that are pure, they are full of Gentiles. So he's kind of on the edge of the Israelite nation. Okay? And so it's not a surprise that a Canaanite woman comes up to him because, you know, it's kind of like here. If you're right next to the University of Tennessee, you better wear orange. But, you know, there are people in some border areas that start wearing other colors. Matter of fact, I happen to know, and I'm not going to call anybody out, but I know there's some folks that would not ordinarily do such a thing. But turns out, you know, when your grandkids or your children or someone head off to a different school, sometimes you find yourself wearing something you might not have worn. Matter of fact, I'm going to be really, really crazy here. You might find out that uh, your, your children move away, start raising their children, and they move to Milan, and their kids go to high school there, and you might find yourself cheering for Milan. Now, Granted, after what I've heard here, you're going to do it really quietly. <laughs> See, I don't even wear purple. I wore blue, and I got yelled at. So I know there's some, some strength there. But the simple fact is, is we try to keep things quiet. We, try, you know, we, we have this tribalism, but the further you get away from the center of the tribe, sometimes the more you have to interact with people of other tribes. And that's a good thing because you can interact without divesting yourself of who you are. That's the story today. You see, Jesus is walking down the road and this woman starts yelling. And you know, I gotta tell you right now, just the fact that a woman is yelling to a man in this day and age is not a normal occurrence. Women did not talk to men outside of their family groups. That was just and that didn't matter, it wasn't just the Jews, that was pretty much a, a cultural thing throughout the different regions. And so that itself would have raised eyebrows. Now, before this situation happened, if you read back in the beginning part of Matthew, the disciples had just been kind of chewed out for not washing their hands ceremonially. So they were accused of not keeping the customs of the Jews. And now they have a woman yelling after their rabbi, you know. It's like you don't want to get caught talking in class right after you've been sent to the principal. It just looks like things are piling up. But that's what's happening. And so his disciples say, Lord, you've got to get rid of her. You've got to dismiss her. This, you know. And he starts his dialogue. Now, at first, he's talking to his disciples, but he's doing it in a loud voice to people here. I came for the lost sheep of Israel. Well, he was considered a prophet. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. And so... For him to make that statement, I have come to those of Israel who need to hear the word. And they would have been like, yes. 
And yet the woman, still not deterred by this, comes and kneels at his feet and says, Lord, I need your help. My daughter is possessed by a demon. I am desperate. And then he says, It is not right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. It is not right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. In other words, I came to the tribe of Israel. I came to the children of God. Not to the dogs in the street. Kind of harsh. I mean, of all the sayings that Jesus is, you know, that we put on bumper stickers, do you think this one will ever make it? Do you, think, do you think this will ever be a prominent feature on people's Facebook pages? Well, probably not. Because even back then, you know, they often referred to the Jews and anybody that was non-Jewish, the Gentiles, were referred to as dogs. And I don't care how you clean it up, there's, a, there's one commentary I saw, I go, well, they were really using the word puppies. Well, that's cute. But I don't think I want to be referred to any kind of animal, four-legged or otherwise, especially a dog. Especially in that region, because dogs were scavengers. You know, there, there, there were some domesticated, but let's face it, it's not like today when you see people pushing them in little, little dolly carts and, you know, dressing them up, which, by the way, is wrong. I mean, I know I have a bad reputation. I love animals, I really do. Um, I don't have any myself. I'm allergic to them. But that's okay. But you should not be putting dogs and cats in sweaters. God already gave them clothes. What's the weird part is I see people shave their dog and then put them in a sweater. But that's off subject. So if this saying was as harsh as it sounds and it comes from the mouth of our Lord and Savior, our Messiah. There's got to be some way to wrap our head around. And you know, the Canaanite woman provides us with the vehicle for that. Because she doesn't take offense. She doesn't get offended. She doesn't say, oh, that's it. I'm going on Twitter. I'm going to tell everybody, you can't talk to me like that. You know? No. She says, this is true. But even dogs are fed by the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Immediately his response is, great is your faith. What you've asked for will be done. But let me take you back to that. Even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's tables. We've already identified the children. Who are the children that are sitting at the table? The Israelites. Who are the dogs? If you're not sure, look around the room. That'd be us. And that might be offensive at first, but think about it. If you really go back to, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking back to when my son was little. Now, we didn't have animals, but I've had friends that have had dogs. You ever been feeding the kid, and the kid's eating some of the food, and then they throw some on the floor? What happens if you have a dog? Matter of fact, from then on, you put the kid in a bib, and the dog's right there. Because they know something's coming. The point of this is not to super elevate one group over another. Yes, those are God's chosen people. But the master has set the table. And at the master's table, who was fed? The children and the dogs. Those that would come in here are taken care of. Now, if you can get over the fact that I have now multiple times called you all dogs. But know this, I've always, you know, as a pastor, what do people usually refer to a pastor as? They go, this is our shepherd. Well, there's only one shepherd as far as I'm concerned, that's the good shepherd. I've always referred to myself as, you know what, I'm a sheepdog. My job is just to nip at the heels of the flock and keep them together while, while, the, while, the, while the shepherd does what the shepherd needs to do. You know, so I'm comfortable with that moniker. I'm comfortable, you know what, if I have to be a dog to get in the kingdom of heaven, so be it. I just hope I'm a really noble breed, like a shepherd or something. 
you know, no, make me a chihuahua. But if I got to be a chihuahua, I'll, I'll take whatever I can. Because that, again, is the level that sometimes we have to get our mind to. Again, we start thinking this way, top down, and putting ourselves on top, and all of a sudden we, we start getting things wrong. But when we turn that over and we realize that we are beneath the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God. And that's what this is all about, is that God's grace is eternal. And His grace is sufficient. And His love is everlasting. And He never breaks His promises. He never goes back on His covenants. Even when we fail, He does not. And so, even the very least in His kingdom, live in the glory of the Heavenly Father. And so, whether you're first place or last place, or somewhere in the middle, having a place at God's table, well, that's a result of God's grace. And even if it's kind of a harsh saying, I think it's a great story because it lets us know. Now you may, may be one of these wonderful people and lucky that you've had great things happen in your life and you feel really good about yourselves and that's wonderful. Uh, most people I meet, they have a lot of good things, but especially when we talk about religion, we start thinking about all the bad and the negative stuff that we've done or who we are, and I'm not worthy, and I will tell you, you're absolutely right. You're not worthy, I'm not worthy. None of us are worthy. The Israelites were not worthy. They were made worthy because God chose them. We are not worthy, but we are made worthy because Jesus Christ chooses us. And isn't that better news? Because if we made it because he chose us, then we can't fail. And we know that he does it. Which means what? That our salvation has been worked out. That we will be fed. That we will be taken care of. Through his grace. And then able to live out. Our faith. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Almost Heavenly Father we come before you praising you and glorifying you for the grace that you have given the promises you have kept we ask now Lord that as we conclude our worship here today that this message would resonate in our hearts and in our minds and in our souls and that we would not get hung up on the little details the little things that sometimes vex us we would not let ourselves be confused or distracted from the true message and the truth you give us that you love us that you created us for a purpose and that you are always with us regardless of what we see, regardless of what we face. And so we glorify you and praise you through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen and amen. I invite you now to stand and sing our closing hymn, The Solid Rock, verses 1 and 4. Receive now the benediction of our Lord. Brothers and sisters, we have gathered in the house of the Lord to worship in spirit and in truth. We have heard his word proclaimed. Therefore, through the power of the Holy Spirit, receive the peace of Christ which passes all understanding. May he be and abide in you now and forevermore. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Go in peace to love and serve our Lord.